Um, well, hello everyone, and thank you so much for joining to the June edition of the um, the Urbanist Meetup. My name is Patrick Taylor. I am the Education and Programming Director here at the Urbanist. Um, I wanted to start with a brief land acknowledgement that um, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself of the Duwamish tribe. Um, and also I want to thank you all for coming out and for your support. We're a donor and volunteer powered organization that examines urban policy to improve cities and the quality of life. Um, if you'd like to donate to support the work that we do or volunteer, please reach out. It's through your support that we've been able to um, hire a part-time executive director and editor and to be able to start paying um, writers, which has been a really wonderful transition for the organization and I think will help ensure our long-term sustainability. We very much appreciate it. And we're going to be taking a break from in, uh, online meetups for the summer, but we hope to have some in-person events um, that we can announce shortly. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to um, Toshiko Grace Hasegawa and Ryan Packer, editor of The Urbanist, who will be asking questions. I mean, also, I just want to know, we, this, are, this is being recorded live, um, just so everyone knows, um, and it will be available for doing later. All right, thank you so much for joining us, Port Commissioner Hasegawa. Thank you so much for having me, Patrick, Ryan, and everyone else at The Urbanist, and I really look forward to a great conversation. Um, yeah, thanks, Patrick. I'm really excited to have the newly elected uh, Port Commissioner here with us. Um, just to give people a little bit of background on uh, Commissioner uh, Hasegawa, um, she was appointed by Governor Inslee as the Executive Director of the uh, Washington State Commission on Asian Pacific uh, uh, American Affairs in 2018. Um, and she's worked as a staff member for the Office of Law uh, Enforcement Oversight in King County and in the Office of uh, King County Council Member Jean Cole Wells before being um, elected uh, this past uh, November as um, uh, Port Commissioner for, uh, for the Port of Seattle. Um, and so I kind of wanted to um, start with, I think a lot of people, you know, the port commissioners have been getting a lot more attention than uh, in recent years, but I think there's a lot of people who are still kind of not sure what a port commissioner even does. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm kind of would want, I'm, I'm really eager to ask you how you see the role um, and, and what you do. Well, you know, I just want to start out by thanking everybody so much for hosting this virtual space because your role in promoting access to government, civic engagement, and creating a dialogue and understanding about government, and including special governments like the Port of Seattle, um, what we do, how it impacts folks, and why it's important. Um, I was so proud to be your endorsed candidate um, and um, it was, uh, you know, deeply grateful to have earned the support of many of the folks in your readership um, and your reach. And so I really bring um, a sense of humility to this position, acknowledging that um, I am the fifth woman ever um, alongside Commissioner Muhammad and the first um, woman of Asian ancestry to occupy a space like this. And so when we talk about access to democracy, we're talking about representative government um, and so that is so much how I view my role as a port commissioner. Um, on a technical basis, what we do is we um, influence policies, budget, um, and oversight for port operations. Uh, the Port of Seattle is unique in that it consists of both a um, marine port and also an airport. Usually it's one or the other. We are also the fourth largest container port in the Pacific Northwest, as Senator Cantwell just described it to me um, last weekend over coffee. She says that we are the Pacific port in the time of the Pacific when trade relations with um, Asia will only increase and we're grappling with ongoing supply chain issues. We're also the premier city um, in the Pacific Northwest with very real challenges as a growing city. Um, and we all have a role to play in plugging into um, thinking about what some of those um, short-term, but also long-term strategies are going to be, particularly how to effectively deal with growth. I'm excited about these um, challenges. Um, I ran with the priorities of economic recovery um, in an equitable way. That means access to jobs and contract opportunities. That means opportunities for workers and businesses alike. Um, I also ran on a platform of 
specifically reducing pollution. The port has a tremendous carbon footprint uh, with its aviation and maritime sectors. And so um, I really want to be a part of the solution, particularly in keeping in mind the way um, environmental justice, the, the framework works to make sure that we are centering um, communities of color and historically marginalized um, and disparately impacted communities in this conversation of, um, of cleaning up our act as a port. Um, and so, you know, I, um, it's, I thought what I would do here, Ryan, is actually just kind of start from the beginning and give you some framework of how it's going. I am almost six months into the position. I've blinked and here we are. And so I want to just check in with everybody and let you know um, what's happened so far, because it's been a lot. Um, the port in the first, um, uh, you know, in the first hundred days on the job, I took over 150 meetings uh, with between briefings and meet and greets and tours um, and um, and just really getting to know the ins and outs of the port. Um, I received my committee assignments that I wanted to also share with you all. So you'd be interested to know that um, I'm officially a member of the Sustainability um, Environment and Climate Committee. Um, that was an assignment that I really wanted, um, just understanding um, the role that the port has, particularly now with the Biden administration and some unprecedented investments that we're making into our infrastructure and decarbonizing our maritime sector, including with infrastructure, is so important to me. Um, and so I was really pleased to, to be able to secure that assignment. My other committee assignment is the Waterfront and Industrial Lands Committee that I know you all are going to be really, really interested in. So I wanted to make sure up front that you know that I'm on that. I know that this group is also really interested in airport operations. I came prepared with information in case you have some questions later on about airport developments so that I can give updates, but full transparency, I'm not on the Aviation Committee. Um, but again, my role as commissioner is to be a conduit, do what I can to be able to present information. If I don't have it, I'll get it for you. Um, but most importantly, get your thoughts on that and be able to listen as you articulate your position on issues so I can keep that in mind as I'm growing my information and my knowledge bank. That makes sense. So we'll get to that if you want to in Q&A, but I thought for the purposes of my uh, pedantic presentation, I would stick to what I definitely um, have been working on um, and excited to bring to this conversation. My other committee assignments, um, you know, it's not why I applied for the job, but I, you know, it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to be able to take it on is the Aquarium Committee. There are so many exciting um, developments on the waterfront um, along that, um, that continuous bike route um, that goes all the way from Marginal Way to T90, T91. Um, and so I've been able to take some walking tours along the waterfront, see what's missing, see what, what would um, improve the experience, not just the pedestrian, the bikers. There's so much underway right there. So it's good to um, get out of, out of a car and, and actually take a slow walk along to see um, how that project is starting to shape up. And then industrial lands, I know is of um, uh, great, um, interest to this group as well. I'm on the Portwide Arts Committee, also not why I ran, fringe benefit, <laughs> if you're interested in any of that. But what I know will also keep your interest is I'm a member of the PSRC Transportation Policy Board. Um, and so I'm plugging into that conversation a little bit late in the game. A lot of the big decisions has already been made, um, but um, there's a lot on the horizon in terms of federal funding and priority projects. So I'm pleased to have that assignment as well. And one of the reasons why I'm pleased to have that assignment, hello Cascadia High Speed Rail, I see that you've joined us here today, is one of the reasons that, um, that I wanted to run as well. So we're all about at the port making sure that we are um, optimizing um, the, the flow of goods and people around our region. I mean, we have a really important role to play with that, both with the, the maritime waterfront, um, with freight, um, mobility uh, with uh, with uh, tourists coming off of cruise ships, and also with our uh, with the tremendous environmental impact of increased um, flights and airport operations. Um, one of the things that I was firm on, folks, of what's the port have to do with this? 
was that we need to be thinking long term in terms of solutions about alternatives um, to cars and alternatives to flights to get to where we need to go. And one of those tremendous ideas, which we are um, long overdue um, for putting a plan together, is the notion of high speed ground transportation um, as an alternative, a useful, dependable, timely alternative that is safe and will most importantly drive down our carbon footprint as a region and also increase mobility um, for people who need to get from point A to point B. Um, and, um, and so, you know, I'm really pleased to know that um, at the state level, you know, Governor Inslee signed a memorandum of understanding um, they are, we are working with other states to put together a framework and have a public engagement approach, right? We're, we're beginning, beginning to work on some scenario analyses. Um, and there's, I believe there's also been a notice of a funding opportunity for a federal state partnership uh, for intercity passenger rail grants that might um, be expected for this fall. So we anticipate that WashDOT will be submitting a grant application for this program, which will require letters of support. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I noted that for this um, group as well. Um, high-speed rail, or what we can also refer to as um, you know, high-speed ground transportation is also a priority of the Seattle Chamber. And so one of the things I wanted to share with you is that the Chamber is actually going to be organizing a delegation come November to Kobe, Japan, so that all of us can go ahead, hop on those Shinkansens and ask the questions about what it took um, to actually um, launch an effective high-speed rail um, network um, in, in somewhere that's so far ahead of us in that. We need to start thinking now and hopefully 20 years down the road, we can see it into fruition. So that's something um, that I'm excited um, to be able to dig into a little bit. Um, and I think it's also noteworthy that um, we also made sure that the port was plugging into the conversation at the state for the Move Ahead Washington transportation package. And what we were adding to the conversation um, with the voices of support was that we also wanted to make sure come the next um, legislative session that there's going to be specific investments into decarbonizing the maritime heavy, in, uh, heavy transportation infrastructure. So that might look like shore power. It might look like a place to hook up for some of our big equipment um, that also needs to go electric, um, stuff like that. So we want to make sure that uh, that we're just pulling all the levers so that we can make the investments into the infra infrastructure that need to happen um, as really with a sense of urgency and as soon as possible. Um, so. Um, Cruise, you listed cruise as one of your updates. <laughs> so this is sort of um, an enigma and it's gonna require an ongoing effort. Um, I am very transparent about my opinion about cruise. Um, I, you know, when I ran, I, um, I vocalized reservations about its carbon footprint, about the, the volume of greenhouse gas emissions, about what it takes to be able to sustain a single cruise ship. Um, there are ongoing concerns, not just about air pollution, but about water pollution, about um, wash water and, um, and wastewater dumping. Um, you know, we have protections against that thanks to the Port of Seattle's, you know, uh, policies that go beyond what federal regulations require um, so that there's no dumping while they're at birth. But then what happens when you cross jurisdictional lines? And last we checked, all the oceans are connected. Um, right, and then there's also ongoing con concerns about the quality of life and workers' rights um, for the people, for the crewmen and women who are actually on board. So um, we're plugging into the conversation about what we can do um, to improve the cruise industry as an environmental and social justice um, actor. Um, and that being said, we had a record number of cruise, cruises call at um, our home port. Um, it's the Alaska cruise industry, right? And one of the things that I campaigned on was that the port is in a position to bring together industries and businesses and government and community members in order to lead on getting solutions. And so, um, so I was really, 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 really 
enthused when last month we were able to um, announce our green corridor. And the idea is that every cruise ship that moves through our last from Alaska to Vancouver, BC to our waters here in the Sound uh, will have net zero um, greenhouse gas emissions and carbon emissions. And how do we make sure that all of us are moving towards that goal um, in a concerted effort? And so we have convened the different ports, we have convened cruise lines um, to make sure that we are actually working intentionally on that to create what we're referring to as a green corridor. And that's the kind um, of leadership that I was wanting um, and, I'm, and I'm so glad to see happening at the port. Um, and also you asked about how I see the role as port commissioner. Um, one of my frustrations, and I think frustrations that many people have about the port when you are privy to its existence and what it does is how hard it is to get information about how much red tape there is about their different big scale projects. And so one of the things that I think is really integral to any elected position is promoting, and these are just pillars of good public service, is promoting transparency and accountability in your operations. And so um, I asked the port to convene a first ever public study session to lay a common and public foundation of the information that we as commissioners are receiving. And um, I'd like to thank the urbanists for amplifying that. It created, I think, a really meaningful dialogue. And we're going to host subsequent roundtable discussions because in that study session, it was just like a commission briefing that was, you know, live stream, there was an opportunity for public comment. So we're going to do roundtable um, sessions that actually bring people in to, to be able to weigh in. More to come on that. Um, but, you know, again, it's, it's about the ongoing effort to be able to improve accountability of cruise operations. If our policies are where they, where they should be, how do we make sure that cruise lines are actually in step with that and in compliance with that? That's part of what I'm looking at. The other thing is if the policies aren't as strong as they should be, um, then how do we think creatively in order to promote good stewardship of our environment and treatment of workers? Um, yeah, that was a great um, a great rundown of, of all the um, issues. Um, to get into some some of the more of these details here, um, I guess my big one question I really wanna ask you is, um, you know, what, is, what has surprised you the most in terms of getting into this role the first six months? Uh, what's been the biggest thing that, that you have been kind of um, uh, unexpected, uh, has been unexpected in the, uh, the role um, taking, taking uh, office? Um, you know, I've, um, uh, <laughs> this is absolutely, there's a demand for it to be a full-time job. I think the number of um, of dense briefings, um, you hit the ground running, but even at a full sprint, it's going to take a long time um, to fill your knowledge bank and put together a, like a really concerted strategy. Um, I mean, surprise is probably not the right word. We knew that it was going to be a lot of work ahead, um, but I've actually been really, I guess, um, if surprised, pleasantly surprised with how welcoming and how um, generous everybody has been in order to share the knowledge that they do have and make sure that we have um, the support that we need in order to be successful. So I know it's a lame answer, but it's what I've got. Um, you mentioned uh, the the bike path on the waterfront. I do have to bring yeah. that up since you, uh, since you mentioned it. Um, I know that uh, we were first to report that that the city is currently planning to kind of route bikes around um, T40, uh, uh, sorry, um, the T66 uh, um, to to kind of, you know, um, which will require crossing the street twice. And it's kind of um, not been seen as, as the best um, proposal. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know that um, particularly Commissioner Calkins has been kind of trying to save this another way forward. And I'm wondering if you can tell us anything about about yeah, that. yeah. Um, so this has actually come before the Waterfront Industrial Lands Committee, which is um, which is co-chaired by me 
and Commissioner Fellerman. And so he's also really thinking creatively about what we can do to improve the experience. Um, I think what um, what we can establish right now is that like the priority for everyone is safety, right? We need a continuous route and that's gonna be safe and protected. Um, and we're only as safe as the least experienced rider among us. Um, and so, you know, I understand the argument that um, you know, it we don't want to have to cross the street. How do we promote safety um, for 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 riders, for pedestrians, whether we like cruise or not, and even if it's seasonal for the passengers, we're going to be um, loading and unloading there as well. Um, and so, you know, how do we think outside of the box in order to get to something that's a, a yes and? And so. Actually, today was a budget retreat for the commissioners and Commissioner Fellman very creatively proposed um, perhaps taking setting aside funding um, to develop um, the, the port owned property next to the trolley lane um, on that side of the street um, and, and see if maybe that that might be something that works. But that's the newest updates that I have on it. Um, and that's where the conversation is. And we hope to remain in close partnership with the city of Seattle to come to um, the best outcome possible for that bike route. Um, I, I have a more general question about that whole issue. Um, it seems to me, I think a lot of followers of um, transportation in Seattle will, will look at the things that the port gets involved in. Um, in terms of the projects uh, like, like Lander Street or uh, West Seattle Bridge um, and kind of see, uh, and I'm thinking of the, um, the, the proposed protected by Clan and West Marginal Way um, that has been uh, under a lot of attention from the port um, and kind of see um, pedestrian and bicycle safety and the things that the port advocates around in terms of freight movement as being at odds, um, if not, frequently, uh, oftentimes, I would say. And so I'm wondering what your thoughts are in kind of moving forward and, and, and being able to achieve um, our safety goals while still moving freight, which is obviously a goal that everyone shares. Yeah, absolutely, right. And I, I, I come to this from the perspective of knowing that we have to address our freight mobility. And when we work to address freight mobility to address our supply chain issues, we're also going to the idea is to get single passenger cars off the road. That's going to go a really long way. Um, and, you know, better connecting the West Seattle community um, if with, you know, a, a, a light rail station, um, alternatives to having to drive across the bridge or under the bridge to get to where they need to go off of, get them off of West Marginal Way, East Marginal Way. Um, so, you know, that th those are the same strategies that are going to reduce our carbon footprint as well. Um, and so, you know, the, the port actually, um, I have a PowerPoint that I wanted, I wanted to share the image about some of the work that we did on, um, on East Marginal Way. And I'm wondering if I can share that image and Eric, I have, um, my advisor, Erica Chung on the line as well. And so we have a, a photo of what we've done with, um, that way, um, with with marginal way there as well so hopefully we can drop that into the chat so people can see it and then uh, you can yeah. share it so, yeah if you're able to share a screen you should be able to do that okay i can't uh drop it into the chat but i could share it in the screen let me see if i can do that yeah um but this proposal did have buy-in from stakeholders um and so making sure that we have a protected place for pedestrians for bicyclists so that they do have alternatives to safe alternatives that they can entertain to driving into where they need to go. Um, so I really do see that there's an opportunity for a win-win situation here. Um, yeah, and the other thing that struck me is, can you go down to the last slide? That wasn't the, oh no, the third to last slide. Mm -hmm. That's the one. The other thing that struck me was we went to Bilbao, Spain for an offshore wind conference. Um, to understand, you know, wind power and how we might be able to harness that as an emerging, emerging industry here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, but just being in Spain, 
and seeing the way that their streets are set up to protect bicyclists. <laughs> it's not novel. It can be done, right? Europe does it very, very well. Uh, we want to see this happen all the way down through the waterfront, right? Um, and, and all the way through. And so again, that, that safety aspect is really top of mind um, for everyone as we're, as we're talking, including with our partners at the Northwest Seaport Alliance. For context, the Port of Seattle is in agreement with the Port of Tacoma um, in a joint venture in order to um, improve our um, trade and, and commerce footprint globally. Uh, we, are, we are competing globally by acting regionally in conjunction with the Port of Tacoma. And this is, um, they have um, a, a lot to do to answer to the supply chain congestion issues with trucks specifically. Um, and so we, we need to work in conjunction with them on some of that, but this is the Port of Seattle investment right here. Um, so, uh, and so we were able to get some community input on that as well. Yeah, thanks for sharing the East Marginal project. I think we're all really excited about that. Finally having a- Go down one full, slide also, Eric. A full connection in between downtown West Seattle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is what Ryan was talking about earlier. Um, and- um, and this is close. So this is a little bit further south on, on the waterfront there. So there is another point earlier on, I think also in the, the continuous bike route where folks also have to cross. So that's not mm. unique to Pier 66. I think the argument is that people don't want to have to go like this as they're biking from, you know, mm. from one, from north to south and vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, Can I tell you a bike a good, story? That's a good point. Uh, absolutely. Um, Eric will drop a link in the chat that you guys can share later, but um, the Port of Seattle had a really cute success story last week. set of bicycles, but they wanted to make sure their bikes had a second life in community. He was a Rainier Beach High School graduate, but the port can't um, donate to a nonprofit organization. Bike Works does this. They make sure that bikes get second lives, um, but it became this whole bureaucratic nightmare. Um, and so the students actually led the NAACP Youth Council advocated to the Seattle Public School Board to make sure that they came into an agreement with the Port of Seattle so that we were able to donate our the Port of Seattle Police Department bike fleet to the Seattle Public Schools and from Seattle Public Schools to Rainier Beach High School. And we were down there last week on Wednesday. Um, they have their mascot is the Vikings and they have a group called the Viking Vikings. Um, this is a majority minority neighborhood with a predominantly BIPOC student body and it was so cool to see how excited they were to get this gift and it was that's also I think case in point why representation matters like it was a Rainier Beach High School grad that thought to donate it to the high school so it was just sort of a special moment thanks for the point of privilege um yeah I so um I don't have too much time I do want to get to a couple questions but I do want to ask you sort of about um, the port and affordable housing comes up fairly regularly. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are not super clear on sort of how the port can be involved in helping uh, affordable housing, uh, make housing more affordable in the, in the region. I know obviously it's an important issue in terms of providing housing for, for port employees and making sure that it's affordable for, for those, living, those uh, family Absolutely. wage jobs. But um, yeah. how can the port be more involved in, in uh, and increasing the stock of affordable housing? That's such an important question. So through my role as co-chair of the Ports Waterfront Industrial Lands Committee, I'm one of our leads with the city of Seattle's continuing industrial and maritime strategy conversation. Um, and that was actually launched by Mayor Durkin, um, but the current administration has also expressed an interest in helping ensure that the ports can function efficiently. Um, and we are trying to balance the need for maintaining a functional port economy, to your point, Ryan, with the challenge of meeting the demands of this thriving and growing city. Um, and how do we do that without compromising the land that has historically been protected and preserved for industrial uses? 
So there are, there's a number of reasons why you want to do that. But I think also it's because we don't want to see the sprawl of industrial activity. And that's really important to me and I think everyone in our region. Um, and so it's that same principle of density and clustering, right? Um, so we're really glad to have had willing partners in the city council, like Councilmember Dan Strauss, who understand the nuance and how difficult this is. We're active contributors in advocating for density, right? Making sure that we're building around places that make sense, like light rail stations and residential neighborhoods. I live on Beacon Hill. Please bring on the housing. There are vacant houses down the street. They just replaced one vacant lot with five units. Please do that, right? Um, we, we, we need to build, um, and I'd love to see that solution happening. Um, and the port's going to continue to advocate for the pres preservation of industrial lands, but um, we can also think about where we can plug in to make sure that we are leveraging our funds to support affordable housing for our workforce, our industrial workforce, who need places to be able to go home and stay and be able to use mass transit to come into the waterfront to work these industrial jobs. So we have to stay thoughtfully engaged on this conversation. Um, with the projected growth that we have around the terminals, and particularly, it's not just Terminal 5 and Phase 2, not just Terminal 18. I mean, we're talking about what's going on at Terminal 46, where cruise is officially off the table, right? We want to see that used for its historically industrial purposes. It also means a projected increase in cargo and container ship um, activity. So let's just be thoughtful about that. Um, you know, and it doesn't seem to me that that's where people would want to live. <laughs> um, so it's it's an ongoing conversation and we have to be active participants in it. Uh, but so there's a little bit of a tension in terms of some of the places where our most high capacity transit is is being planned. Soto, Smith Cove, Inner Bay are mm -hmm. also very tied up in the industrial uses. Um, and so how do you see the, the port's role in sort of developing those those neighborhoods? A lot of the land in those neighborhoods is, is owned by the port, uh, but it's also kind of the center of the, the transit network. How do you how do you see the port's role there? Yeah, you know, and and growth is it's a serious challenge. You have increased industrial activity, you're gonna have in increased workforce with increased needs for um, public transportation and um, and as jobs and, and other opportunities continue to come to this city and this region, you're gonna have a growing population that needs to be able to sleep somewhere. We have an existing um, housing crisis that needs to be addressed. And so, you know, the, I, the, the, the values, the, the principles stay the same in that we need to be able to invest in affordable housing, uh, right? Not just market rate housing which is also where I see a lot of the conversation happening um, because it's important that we have an, an equity approach to these, to, to these solution buildings as well. Uh, switching gears, I wanna get a couple, a couple of questions that were submitted. Um, Richard asked, uh, what do you think will help reduce air pollution levels in the Duwamish Valley? You know, the Duwamish Valley. So um, the Duwamish River Community Coalition has been such an active and vocal participant um, in some of these um, abilities to identify solutions. And so there's a couple things that need to, that are happening and need to continue to happen in tandem. One of them is prevention. Um, right. One of them is thinking long term and strategically, as we've already discussed, in order to um, to reduce airport impacts and also maritime impacts. And it looks like transforming slowly um, with corporate accountability um, over the course of time, um, these industries and the way that they pollute. Um, but the other thing is also remediation. And that means like literally cleaning up the generations of industrial harm and waste that have taken place. Um, the Duwamish River is um, not even safe to fish out of. And so we have safe, uh, fun, to, fun, fun to catch but toxic to eat campaigns 
um, going right now in multiple languages to warn communities about the dangers of eating what you catch out of that river. Um, and so we've been working on with the Sustainability Environment and Climate Committee on some of those uh, remediation projects in the um, Lower Duwamish River and the East Waterway. Um, you know, understanding that we want the whole Duwamish River to be cleaned up um, to a place as much as possible. Um, and um, and so there's there's a number of projects underway and it's gonna take time, but we are actually taking those up in committee and approving funding for those as we speak. Uh, but it has to be community led, right? They're the ones who are absolutely unbending in the standards of what we expect. Um, and there's multiple players um, outside of just the Port of Seattle, right? You have ecology, uh, you have, um, uh, you know, you have the feds, um, you have the city of Seattle and you have King County. Um, and all of us have to, to work together in order to understand our peace um, in remediation. Um, and then the other thing that I also want to bring up is stormwater. Um, and every time it rains and with this crazy unprecedented uh, rainfall, um, even though I might be a pluvial file and partial to the rain, it also um, pretty dependably means um, an overspill of some of our, our local sewage. And so we have to think pretty thoughtfully about um, stormwater and wastewater and what we're doing um, to actually improve our systems. And we can, we, um, we, we're taking that up at the commission as well um, to, in order to collaborate with, with King County on that. Um, Brian, I'm also like, I kind of wanted to go back to the last conversation about housing also, uh -huh. just thinking about it and um, it just deserves attention. Um, you know, the 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 industry the industry that is housed so the in, the industries that we're trying to preserve right because um because there is a constant effort by the city to encroach on these industrial lands that have such a critical role in facilitating a functioning flowing supply chain we have all felt the impacts of a failing congested supply chain and there are multiple points of failure, but that freight mobility piece, I know everybody is tired of hearing the term freight mobility, but it's such an important and huge piece to this um, of how we're flowing, facilitating the flow of goods because that waterfront is where the container ships come in. It's there and it's Tacoma for our region, right? And so it's impacting these, this group of, of this growing city as population is living there. So I'm mindful of it, um, but we're also thinking about how these are good, like these industry jobs are good paying jobs. We are suffering from this silver tsunami because it's old white dudes who occupy these, these occupations. So many people don't know that they're even available to them, but we can actually build wealth within communities who are disparately impacted, are disparately experiencing unemployment, are disparately and experiencing even houselessness and displacement from their, their home communities that would benefit from these family wage jobs on a working waterfront. Um, so that's sort of the other like philosophy and angle that I come from it as um, in thinking about the importance of preserving opportunity for good industry jobs. Um, I want to, I just really want to make sure that I was acknowledging that piece because it's a, such a tender balance as in my role as a port commissioner um, and what my J-O-B is, which is to promote economic opportunities. And my, my role is to do that in an equitable way um, for meaningful outcomes. So that's sort of just how I'm, I'm approaching it. And I thought it's important piece of the conversation to lift up. Um, we spent a lot of time on the, the, the maritime side there. Um, I wanna switch to the airport side for a second. Um, I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> um, this the state is sort of heading toward um, having a second airport, a second commercial airport in the yeah. Seattle region. Um, how do you see expanded commercial air travel and yeah. versus the state's climate goals? Yeah, um, that's an interesting question in relation to the state's climate goals. 
Um, keeping in mind, you know, all the different strategies that the K that the state um, has recently launched, um, including investments into sustainable aviation fuels um, to try and more quickly transform these industries. Listen, um, I live on Beacon Hill on the flight path, um, and I also chair the Highline Forum, which is for airport adjacent cities to be able to come and talk about this very issue. And we have to have a conversation about corporate accountability. Like airline, the airlines have the largest role to play in transforming their fleet. <laughs> Newer fleets are going to be um, they're going to be cleaner and they're going to be quieter. Um, so if there's there's simply meeting demand and growing, you know, increasing the number of flights that they have coming in and out. Um, what are we as a port doing to incentivize them to transform their fleets or to be better stewards or to make um, even bigger, better investments, philanthropic investments into the communities that are most greatly impacted? Um, and so, you know, I would love, again, I'd love to see alternatives um, to flying. Um, and the state is considering a second airport the port does not have an official opinion on where they want a second airport to be. Um, but, um, um, you know, we're gonna do what we can to expand. And my, in my personal position as a port commissioner, um, I wanna make sure that we expand on our current footprint and hopefully not sprawl. Um, I, I really wanna do everything in our power to preserve, not just preserve, but also invest in in revitalizing North SeaTac Park, other really important buffer zones, you know, tree canopy that's going to reduce some of those carbon emissions, clean our air, be a wonderful green space for community members. Um, so as we continue to grow as an airport, um, that also can look like sustainable green um, real estate, green infrastructure. Um, and so they also, I deleted it, I'm sorry, but in that slide, they'd also given me some beauty shots of our new international arrivals facility, which is a state of our green building. I mean, it is gorgeous. Next time you fly in from you know, your travel, you'll get to walk through it and it's gonna be a representation of the Pacific Northwest and your, your point of entry and introduction to the United States of America. Um, so um, so I, you know, I, I do think that some kind of building and growth to to, um, you know, to try and keep step with the demand, but in terms of our environmental goals as a state, um, we have so much work to do to get the airlines to be more aggressive. Um, and the last thing that I'll say is that, that we actually award um, awards, certificates, recognitions for the airlines who did the best in XYZ. And it's, you know, you know thank you. And <laughs> I encourage you all to be aggressive in transforming your fleets and investing in um, into mitigating the harm from ultrafine particles that are causing health impacts on community members. Um, dovetails with my next question. You know, a lot of those people who are arriving at SeaTac, they're they're not getting on transit. Uh, they're getting usually getting into a single occupancy or a low occupancy right. car. Um, Last year, the Port Commission voted to um, to expand the airport arrivals drive, um, but have all uh, the Port Commissioners ha have had traditionally had a lot of opinions on how to improve um, light rail access at the airport, uh, luggage racks, etc. Um, what are your thoughts on on the the ground transportation question? Um. Well, we got to do something to make it easier for people, all people, including folks with limited mobility to be able to use the light rail and get from that light rail stop um, to, a, to our terminals and their final, you know, their final gate, um, their boarding gate. Um, again, I'm not on the aviation committee, so I'm not really uh, in full transparency. I'm really not up to speed on what the conversation is about light rail extension or um, or the arrivals drive and the ground transportation. Um, that's something that would go through there, but I do believe that um, it's gonna end up coming back to the full commission for funding approval at some point this year. 
Um, I think this is one of those questions where I, I think it's an important opportunity for me to hear from you all about what your perspective is on something like this. So I take it into account and consideration when these when this comes up before me in committee for conversation, ultimately a decision. Um, well, I think uh, you said you only had 45 minutes. So I think we're a little bit on time, on time here. Um, if that's good for you. <laughs> yeah, we're good. Okay, great. Uh, well, thanks so much for um, taking the time to chat with us today about, about the port. I'm very excited uh, to see, see what you're uh, accomplishing over there um, uh, with the, the very um, uh, it's a significantly changed uh, composition of the, the port commission. So we're definitely uh, tracking and, and uh, excitedly watching uh, what's mm -hmm. happening. I'm just glad to be in connection and um, community with you all. And thank you so much for the opportunity to be accountable to you and everyone who took time to listen to everything that we just talked about. And I welcome any opportunity. Um, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks so much for spending some, some time with us tonight. Have a good night. Bye. Thank you and thank everyone for joining.